Hello, Anthony, and welcome back to Freedom Philosophy TV. Hello, thank you for having me on your show. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, healthcare, or what we call healthcare, and uh, I think we're going to be deconstructing that a little bit and presenting something a little bit more uh, rational. Um, but first, I just want to talk about trends in disease, um, what we've got in the UK, and I think this is this is a fairly uh, global phenomena for societies that have become very westernized and, and have well-developed economies. Um, because people are having less children, there's basically an aging population. There's these baby boomers as well. Uh, and they're not well people. Um, they've, they've got... Uh, these degenerative diseases and the size of the size of or proportion of that population that will have uh, two or more degenerative diseases is rapidly increasing and the size of the population who are uh, in productive work and, and able to to provide the resources to care for this uh, increasingly ill population is on on the decline um, so there's a real uh, financial problem with the, uh, the welfare system um, when it comes to healthcare. Uh, so what we're, we're going to talk about today is, is some potential uh, solutions to this or different approaches um, and uh, just go through them and, and hopefully uh, get some clarity. So um, you mentioned the uh, US model versus the UK model. Uh, could, you, could you elaborate a little bit on that uh, dichotomy? What, what's, the, what's the difference? Well, <laughs> there's perceived to be a dichotomy in the idea that America's healthcare system is very free market and that UK's health system is very um, public. Um, obviously, neither, neither of those are essentially true. Um, uh, in America, uh, the American Medical Association's Council on Medical Education was founded in 1904 and immediately cut, closed down 25 medical schools uh, and then another 10 medical schools in the next three years. Uh, and so that was 35 medical schools in six years, I believe. And, you know, uh, everyone wants to be a doctor, but because of, because of the prestige of being a doctor, but there's high turnaway rates at all the medical colleges, which are actually based on school grades rather than the skills that are necessary to um, perform well as a doctor. So, you know, we all understand supply and demand. If you limit supply, of healthcare, then the price of healthcare goes up. And that's only some of the ways that the state intervenes in healthcare in the United States. There's lots of subsidization through Medicare and Medicaid. And when they last increased that um, ser service, that was in intended to make healthcare affordable to poor and elderly people. In short order, that over 10 years or so, the price of medical care in the U.S. tripled. So a lot of state intervention in the healthcare system in the U.S. Another thing is we have these insurance companies. And, you know, with good reason, people are worried about insurance companies providing healthcare. But um, the regulatory system is a state apparatus. It's not a free market apparatus. So when these abuses that um, happen with these insurance companies in the United States, it's really the state that's responsible for regulating them. And it does so in such a way that it makes it very hard for them to um, provide affordable service. For example, if someone's already got a pre-existing condition and they go to an insurance company, the law says that the insurance company has to take them on anyway. Now, that's just like actually asking for fire insurance after your um, house is already burnt down. Uh, um, I'm, 
people will start saying this sounds like a very incompassionate way of looking at healthcare. But I think by the end of this, we understand that our models for healthcare are extraordinarily compassionate, and we actually really do care about people and want them to want to see them getting better care. Obviously, the problem with getting fire insurance after your house is burned down is the insurance company has to anticipate the cost of that and pass it on to their customers, which is why health, one of the reasons why healthcare insurance is so expensive in the United States. It's also a highly regulated industry. And if you, we know anything about history, actually the way to make products very cheap and affordable is to make them so abundant that they become cheap you know this is why we all have laptops and things like that because the a computer used to be something that only very very rich people could afford now everyone has a phone and often most people have a smartphone that can do things that um, you know the people who landed on the moon they couldn't have even dreamed of having technology that good mm. to land on the, the moon as what you have on your smartphone, you know? So what we really want is a lot of people in the market, we don't want highly regulated markets that favor established hospitals, established pharmaceutical companies, established everything. We need um, to have lots of healthcare provision um, you know, it takes seven years to train to be a doctor, but does everything a doctor do need seven years? Probably not. People who have studied seven years to be a doctor should be doing expert tasks, and there should be graded systems, not what we call in economics barriers to entry, which stop people from going into the industry. Um, we are told every year here in the UK that... Um, oh, we're treating more patients than ever before. As far as I'm concerned, that's a disaster. In a universal healthcare system, we'd find that we were treating less patients and less patients because everyone was getting more and more healthy. What we have is a medical system of sickness, both in the US and the UK. The only thing that's remunerated is being sick. You pay for an operation when you're sick, or the government pays for an operation when you're sick. If you go to the doctor saying, I'm just coming in for a checkup every month, you know, he might think you're some kind of hypochondriac. Um, so, first of all, it's not healthcare, it's a system of sickness. The only thing that's remunerated is sickness, and that's true both here and in the United States. Second of all, it's not universal. If you look at um, actually what's going on, it's rationing. Some people get services and some people don't. There's long waiting lists. People can go into A&E with an appendix that's about to burst and end up waiting overnight or God knows how long before they actually get a bed. So it's not universal. Um, and third of all, it's not free. You know, Neither in the United States nor here is it free. It actually comes at a very, very high cost because um, market forces aren't at work. If you look at something like laser eye surgery, which is in the private sector, when it first came about, it was very exclusive. Only very rich people could afford it. Now it's cheap. Now most people in this country could save up and get laser eye surgery. We know very similar for plastic surgery, which has had knock-on effects on corrective plastic surgery. It's become much cheaper. There's no reason why the government should be spending more and more on healthcare every year. In a sane system, the, tech, the price of all the technology will come down and people will be getting more healthy. So the government will need to spend less money on healthcare. People bristle at the idea of a private system, but it doesn't all need to be private. You know, cooperatives can step in, charities can step in, non-profit organizations can step in, um, uh, volunteering can step in. What we actually have a choice between is whether people want excellent healthcare that's affordable to most people, 
And when it's not affordable to people, benevolence and philanthropy can step in, or they want free at the point of entry healthcare, which is not actually free, it's not universal, it's not healthcare, and it's extraordinarily costly. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to actually introduce a little bit of an anecdote here. Um, I don't want to go too far into these kind of anecdotes, but um, like if, you, if you're a, like a working professional or, or a working person in the UK, um, I think the national insurance uh, contribution, or they call it a contribution, that it's, a, it's of course is an extortive uh, tax, yeah, it takes about 10% of your salary. So if you're actually a relatively well person like myself, um, you know, over the course of your working life, you would have had literally tens and tens of thousands of pounds uh, taken from you, um, and you'll, you'll get potentially no return on, on your investment. That will be spent on other people who perhaps haven't taken as good care of their health or have just you know, had something unfortunate wrong with them. Um, and then when you get something wrong, if it happens to be one of those conditions that is rationed, so as say certain types of cancer, or uh, in my in my case, um, I might want to I might need some special dental care or something like that, uh, then that that money is no longer available for me, my my own money to spend uh, on the condition that I actually have, because perhaps it falls outside of the. Uh, parameters uh, that the state consider essential or high priority uh, for care um, and occasionally you do see things in the newspapers about this um, but in particular like in the UK uh, a lot of dentistry is, is no longer covered by the NHS so just to reinforce really your point that it isn't universal health care um, and it does have to be rationed and there's, there's still, as far as I'm concerned, a great deal of injustice in the system. Well, people consider justice to be that everyone gets access at the point of head entry. So supposing you are a vegan, you happen to be a vegan, but supposing someone is a vegan and they take lots of exercise and you know they don't drink, they don't smoke, um, they and they get lots of fresh air. They buy a sophisticated water filtration system so that their water is nice and clear and pure. Now, on the other hand, you have someone who has bacon for, for breakfast. When they go to work, they go across the road to lunch at McDonald's every day. They like to get really drunk at the weekends they smoke 40 a day. Where is the justice in this person being able to tax the vegan to pay for his heart surgery? Now, I don't mean to be incompassionate here because on the other side of the spectrum, where's the incentive for this um, unhealthy person, this person who lives an unhealthy lifestyle, to take care of themselves. What would exist, hopefully, in a private system that's not modelled on the American model, which, as I've discussed, isn't really private, is this person would have health insurance. Now, just before there was any government intervention in the medical field in the United States, there were friendly fat societies where people grouped together to provide health insurance for one another, and you could get a year's worth of health care for two wages, two days' wages as a laborer. So we're not talking about the cost of health care in the US now. It might be slightly higher because of the technology involved, but we're talking about something that's affordable to everyone. Well, of course, if, if you're in that state, if you're, if you're getting into preventative medicine, um, which is where the free market would, would take people, uh, the, 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 you just wouldn't need a lot of this technology anyway. Um, that, that would be 
uh, the amount of it that a hospital would need to to treat the what would become exceptional cases would be quite small um, at the moment what it is 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 that lots of people are exceptionally unwell um, they they have heart disease uh, cancer uh, diabetes and, and they this affects a huge uh, proportion of, of modern populations and they all need uh, this, this quite intensive and invasive health care and, and uh, drug regimes and so forth. So it, it, it's very high uh, maintenance costs and technical investment. Um, and of course, these, because these, a lot of these diseases are quite intractable as well, because basically the allopathic model can't fix them. Uh, then there's also huge sums being spent on research and the technology associated with that to, to try and fix the problem, which fundamentally, in many cases, uh, needn't be there. Right, right, because a lot of it is based on lifestyle choice. Mm. So supposing you had this friendly society or your insurance cooperative or your private health care or... You know, what, whatever you choose, we're not blocking anything out of the out of the universal model that I'd like to talk about. You know, you don't have to go to a private organisation. You could go to one that's not for profit. Whatever you have, they're going to phone you up if you've got a healthy lifestyle. Either they're going to raise your premium, or they're going to say, you know, look, we're really worried about you. If you have a heart attack, they need to pay however much it costs, £10,000 for your operation. So they've got an incentive to give you a free helpline, free access to counselling if you're, you know, problem, if you've got problematic habits for psychological reasons. It's cheaper for them to give you a bunch of cheap preventable mm than to pay for you being ill. Right now, everything's upside down because the system is remunerated for you being sick. In any sane society, the system will be remunerated for you being well. And we all know this. If you, if, if you, if you had a financial advisor, you'd want to make sure your financial advisor was making more money when you were making money and less money when you were making less money. We want the same with healthcare. And that would be extraordinarily compassionate because no one knows what the solution is. But if you have a healthcare system where there's an incentive structure that uh, remunerates health, you'll start having all the greatest minds in healthcare um, being in trial and error with each other, comparing the results to one another to come up with the best solutions. We need to put those incentive structures in place so that it's health that's remunerated rather than sickness and cheap affordable solutions will follow through the wonderful trial and error of the free market. Right now, the government says, here's how we're gonna do it, boys. And any officiation of the system um, is slow grinding process. In the meantime, after hundreds of billions have been spent on the fight against cancer, today more people contract cancer than ever before. And if you do contract it, you have the same percentage of dying as you did in the 70s. More people have the diabetes, more people have heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, more people have multiple sclerosis, lupus, asthma, migraines, more people have degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's. So something's gone wrong here. And what we need to do is take a look at the incentive structures implicit in the system and look at how we can create a system that is, that is health care rather than sick care is universal because everyone has access to it, even if it's not for free, everyone has access to it because it's exceedingly cheap and where people don't have access, they can get put on a payment plan or go for charity and you know, it's um, uh, that, that, that's what we, that's what we're looking at, really. Yeah, um, and also, uh, and I think this is particularly true before there was was uh, national health care. Doctors, or some doctors, or perhaps even many doctors, would offer um, uh, free uh, sort of work for very poor people who couldn't afford 
um, to pay for it. So, you know, they might go to uh, sort of a, a poor clinic um, in some area and just, just treat people for free. And, you know, I kind of like the integrity of that because if, if you think healthcare should be free, then you should give it for free. Um, yeah, that's great. And yeah, also, uh, um, there's the opportunity cost as well. There's, there's, first of all, there's a great deal of money that, that's going into uh, this huge uh, sickness care industry and, and the uh, pharmaceutical drug industry. That money could have been spent uh, on really enriching people's lives and, and making them more uh, pleasant and positive in other ways, uh, if they, as if, you know, if they weren't ill. Um, and also just, just being well in its own right uh, is, is uh, a terrific advantage in terms of, of productivity and, and satisfaction with life. So there's, you know, it's just winning all round to have preventative medicine and, and to focus on that. If that isn't uh, <laughs> is it preventative, That's right. preventative medicine actually sounds like an oxymoron to me, but um, yeah. Well, here's the thing, you know, on a free market, you know, most people here in this country believe that people should have access to health care if they need it, um, even for free. On a free market, that's called a demand. Mm. If people want that, then that's a demand. So people have displayed that they're willing to pay for it by voting it in through the tax system, which is very encouraging in terms of where we stand because that costs a lot of money. I reckon on a free market, expenditure on healthcare would be a fraction, you know, maybe 10% of what we have to spend now, maybe 5% of what we have to spend now. And I do believe that the ser quality of service would be a lot better. You mentioned a lot of money is on research. Because of the nature of the system, the research is on treating illness. Treating illness. That's because treating illness is what gets remunerated in the system. Yeah. If what was being remunerated in the system was health, then most of the research would be on optimal health. Now, once you have that research going on in optimal health, very soon people know how to create, how to assess any human being in all the ways necessary and give them a tailored plan for how they could optimize their own health. Because that's what the experts in the field would largely be doing. Then you give them a premium based on how well they follow the plan. Yes, exactly. And, you know, this could be ex exceedingly cheap, actually. You know, maybe if they follow the plan, they only have to pay £20 a month, okay? I don't know anyone who can't borrow £20 a month if, if, if they can't pay for that. If they deviate from the plan, then, you know, their premiums start going up. But at the same time, because the organization doesn't want them to be ill, because if they get ill, they have to pay out more money. As I said, they could start providing them free monthly checkups. Maybe that's part of their plan. Maybe the plan says, we will provide you with free monthly checkups. If you don't attend a checkup, you'll have to pay an extra 20 pounds for that month or something like that, or you know, whatever. Start giving people the incentives to take care of their health and we will see a thriving community. As you said, there's an opportunity cost. All these resources that are being spent on healthcare set services, they could be spent on people eating better, people have, you know, having nicer things in their house. You know, you just need to go to the supermarket and see how expensive fruit and vegetables, which are the building blocks of health, are compared to confectionery. The price of confectionery has gone down and down and down. And the price of um, fruit and vegetable, which are the building blocks of health, has gone up and up and up. Yeah, well, I think there's and, a problem with the fruit and veg. Um, as far as I understand it, a lot of it used to be picked uh, by uh, low-wage um, immigrant labour that would, would come into the country 
uh, uh, during the sort of harvesting season and pick it. And, and then with the introduction and increases in minimum wage, that practice has become less economically viable. And, and so the, the costs of um, uh, production for fruit and vegetables have, have instead of declining, have, have risen. Um, and, and of course, that's going to have knock on effects uh, for people that are um, on the borderlines of being able to afford a healthy diet to ha even, you know, even slight increases in price will push them below and into unhealthier uh, diets. And, and then, of course, there's all the increasing in cost of the healthcare that, that follows from that. So it, it's a complete um, malinvestment, basically. And again, of course, it's, a, it's an attempt to, to regulate the free market that just, just, just backfires. As it so often does. I mean, you know, I mentioned before in one of our shows that the, the, it costs it takes seven times as much grain to produce um, a kilogram of beef. So why isn't um, beef seven times as expensive as grain? Yeah. Well, because there's massive subsidies for meat and dairy farmers. The, health, the consensus on health about dairy, you know, they used to say that dairy was good for you and things like that. That's generally not acknowledged in health anymore. People think that dairy is very, very bad for you. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that I, I personally am a vegetarian, you're a vegan. I'm not saying that, you know, people eating no meat, um, sorry, eating any meat is going to kill them or anything. What we do know is that most people in this country eat far too much meat. 24 of the 25 leading causes of illness, causes of death, 24 out of the 25 leading causes of death you are more likely to suffer from those illnesses if you're a meat eater. And 12 of them can be treated by a plant-based diet. That means if people have them already, if they switch to a plant-based diet, which means not just eating chips and you know all yeah. sorts of unhealthy food and bread and things like that, but actually eating proper plant-based diet, they can actually seriously lower their symptoms. So by subsidizing the meat, we have people eating far too much meat and dairy. You know, in the old days, you know, maybe when my grandmother was alive, you know, they may have chicken once a week. Fine. People are eating too much of unhealthy foods. And as you've illustrated and I've illustrated, that's encouraged by government subsidies to the farmer. Yeah. So when the people think that we live in a capitalistic society and oh, it's all free market causing all these problems. But if you look at any sector of the society, people could come to us with any sector of the society. And I'm sure if you, you and I could point out half a dozen ways that the government has intervened in the market, not to make things better, but to make things worse. I mean, I don't agree in any government intervention in the market. That might make me an extremist, but I would just say that makes me a principal person but if they were going to do something like that you know maybe they could tax confectionery and meat and put a subsidy on fruit but then five years later you and I would be having a conversation on this show saying you know the government tried to do a good thing which was to tax sugar and subsidize fruit and all the unintended consequences have been this environmental disaster that in every case, I'm sure, no matter how the government intervened in the market, there would be some unintended consequences that you and I could have a show saying, oh, I wish they had intervened in the free market because it's created an environmental disaster or a health disaster or an unemployment disaster. The wonderful thing about the free market is it's a self optimizing system yeah. people can look at what's in place and look for a way to improve it and come in and provide a better service and then people go to that service and then if there's a problem with that someone can look at that and say oh look no one's seen that this is causing this problem well we can create a product that's even better than that it self optimizes itself over time you get none of that when the government comes in and says here boys Let's run it this way. Well let's, well, let's talk a bit about what we do get and what we have. Um, 
Yeah, there's something quite interesting that I hear Stefan Molyneux speak about in his programs about uh, uh, sort of socially uh, funded programs. And it's, it's something like this. Basically, if you start talking about challenging um, the, the, the privilege of, of uh, the medical cartels and, and the, uh, you know, the doctors, the nurses and the, the pharmaceutical drug industry, if you, if you challenge that, um, basically, they, they're going to face consequences of, of losing a fortune, losing a lot of money and seeing their market dry up. Um, so, and, you know, that means uh, doctors' uh, salaries are going to fall, uh, potentially nurses' salaries might fall. I mean, I don't, you know, we don't know. Perhaps they might actually go up, but there would just be fewer doctors and nurses. Um, it would just be a structurally different market. Um, but undoubtedly there'll be a lot less drugs uh, sold. So that's going to have a very severe ramification uh, for those uh, sectors of the market that are currently privileged by, by, by state uh, protection, essentially. Um, whereas uh, the taxpayer is really only seeing, um, you know, a few pounds a, year, a month taking off, taken away from their uh, income. So the, the, there's, a, there's an imbalance of incentives there. It, it, it's like the, um, uh, the, the tiger chasing the deer. Uh, the tiger is, is running for its um, dinner and the deer is running for its life. And uh, you know, in this case, uh, you can see that um, the people involved in the healthcare industry are not quite running for their lives, um, but they've got a lot more invested in, in manipulating and controlling the market than somebody who's like, well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm losing 100 or 200 pounds a month, whereas in a, in a private healthcare system, I might just lose 50 pounds a month or, or 20 or something. So that there's, there's this disparity of, uh, extreme disparity of incentives uh, that the government creates in the market. And it's very difficult to resolve that. I, I, you know, I, I can't see... How, do, how we step up to, the, to, you know, it's like we just need to take responsibility for ourselves to change, change this around. Um, have you got any ideas about that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's quite a profound um, point. Like, how do we turn the tide on this? Mm. A, a couple of things have been in the media about... Um, there's a there's a article called Labour's uh, private hospital stitch up, um, where they exposed how you know they tried to privatise the management of an NHS hospital, and they did so well. The hospital did so well. Um, you know, even down to little things like getting furniture from Argos instead of wherever they were getting it before and they saved so much money doing so that they could then channel to helping patients but they went and did an, an investigation and the people who did the investigation were um, part had close ties to the Labour Party and unions which oppose NHS privatisation and they basically did a stitch up job where they tried to make it look like this hospital was performing exceedingly badly when it was ex right. performing exceedingly well. Um, you can check out the article yourself. It's very long, and so can your listeners. So every now and then something comes in the media and points to the fact that um, our National Health Service isn't what it seems. Everyone, it sounds like a great idea, you know. It's compassionate. Everyone gets health access to healthcare until you start speaking to people who've gone in there and you said you know the medical the people in the profession are incentivized to protect this I would just like to qualify that you know I think there's a lot of doctors and surgeons I would say the vast majority in there who are doing a good job based on what they've been taught but they've been taught the mainstream medical paradigm which is all about treatment it's not about prevention you know that that's what they're that's what they're trained to do and i've heard people go in there who are very in favor of the nhs coming out 
saying, I cannot believe that's what people are fighting to defend. And it's sad. It's so, so sad because they feel a betrayal of them personally, that they were, you know, you know, they were so in favor of this and they went in and, you know, they had a condition that could turn critical at any point and they had to wait days to get a bed. So I think that the people in there are well-intentioned. I'm not sure about the big pharmaceutical companies and the people who mm. sell all the kidney dialysis machines and things like that. You know, they've got a lot of vested interest in keeping things as a medical um, service of sickness rather than health. But to answer your question of how we turn the tide, you know, we have to start with this podcast. The level of education for alternatives is very poor. You know, I've gone around and, and had a bit of a look and there's a couple of things on the internet, but so, someone will, you know, need to take the points that we've made and do another podcast um, that includes another 10 points that we didn't think of and send it to us and educate us and let's start having a free market of information. In the meantime, you know, people need to step up and realize that um, just because it's you know, if it's free at the point of entry doesn't mean it, it's, it's free and, you know, if you take that attitude and don't take care of your health, then it's not going to be free because you're going to pay in terms of your quality of life. So start um, adopting a healthier lifestyle. Sure. And, um, you know, I just see a, um, a possibility where practitioners are paid for maintaining the health of a reasonable number of clients. Now, whether if they do a good job, whether they, they get paid every month, and if they get do a good job, then they can take on more clients. Whereas if they do a bad job, then they yeah, can only see business. yeah they can only see so many people at a time because their their clients are constantly calling them. I'm ill. I've got this. Another insane thing in the incentive structure I forgot to mention before is every medication has side effects. Right. And then you get medication to medicate your side effects. And because we have a system of sickness, not a system of health, there is no need for health practitioners to really look at whether it's herbal or it's pharmaceutical, whether it's allopathic or whether it's alternative. What is the best treatment that creates the least amount of side effects? Because if that enters a spiral in treating the side effects, that's more money for pharmaceutical com companies. They love that. Let's sell you a pill for your effects, and then let's sell you a pill for your side effects, and then the side effects to the side effects. That's good. We actually need to be looking at a system that would remunerate health and just start having conversations with people and telling people that it's possible. You know, it's possible to create a system of health than sickness. And even if people hate privatization, you could still do this in a status system. You could still get the government to start looking at paying practitioners. Yeah. You know, that's not an ideal solution, but it's a step in the right direction. I agree. I think I'm a little bit more skeptical about the good intentions of, of the, uh, of the sickness care profession. Um, you was, I think you mentioned the, AMA at the beginning of, of, of the show and um, you know this, this is basically a, a industrial lobby um, just a just a more uh, up market if you like uh, union to protect the interests of doctors um, and obviously you know if, 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 if doctors were just pure and well-intentioned they they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, be going to to uh, create these uh, essentially cartels to protect their, their business and, and to uh, r raise the costs of becoming a doctor and so forth. Uh, and it's similar with, with, I think, with the nurses uh, in the NHS um, creating these, these huge unions that uh, in turn fund uh, the Labour Party and, and the, the big welfare parties. Uh, which is essentially just cronyism. I mean, it's no different from the pharmaceuticals uh, protecting their turf um, by paying off politicians and you know buying them 
uh, nice meals out with representatives and so on and so forth. It, it's exactly the same in principle. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that I don't think the the, the healthcare uh, workers have a, have a, a squeaky clean and, and completely moral and above board position. I think there's there's uh, there's cronyism there, and I think it's important to to point that out. Yes, um, very possibly, and you know you, you can only look at people in a in a case by case basis. Sure. I think the real problem here is the religion, the, the ideology behind the NHS, which is stuff like what I talked about in that, um, in that um, article, um, Labour's private hospitals stitch up shocking evidence of how the left sabotaged NHS success story. Mm. There's this ideology of public. It's not public. Nothing is owned by the public. There's no such thing. Either you have control over property or you don't and certain people have control over the property it doesn't belong to you just because the government says it does um, there's this there's this religion and it's immune in many people to being challenged it's just a principle or oh, NHS it should be free for everyone and they care more about that ideology than people's lives yeah and you can chuck all sorts of arguments at them and they just don't care they just don't care or it's an ideology but the thing is it needs to be done enough times that it's acceptable because you do not you do not change someone's mind in one conversation and you do not usually change people's minds what uh, you change the minds of a community one to one people tend to be a lot more open minded than in groups sure and you need to have conversations with people mm. and their other friends need to have conversations with them so that this view becomes an acceptable view because right now you don't care. You don't believe in NHS. People think you're heartless. Yeah, that's you know, I, I, yeah. I, I've got a clean conscience because I've dedicated my adult life to trying to find the best ways to help other people. Yeah. Um. You know, I'm I'm not a heartless person. I care about people getting access to high quality healthcare and being healthy. But if you say you care about the poor and you care about health, then you're going to look at the real world evidence yeah. of what creates health and what creates affordable health care. Not put your ideology of NHS above people's health care. And I think that's what people do. They put their ideology above the real world evidence of what actually creates Good health, and I suggest that anyone Google an article called "How the Government Solved the Healthcare Crisis" yeah, I'll put a link for an analysis. Yeah, for analysis of how the government stepped in and made the provision of healthcare much more expensive. Yeah. So, um, it's a great story. So, that. I, I wanted to talk a little bit here um, and, and be a bit topical as well. Talk about the Baltimore uh, riots and what's going on over there. And I, I've been reading some articles recently about, um, Baltimore. And of course it's, a, it's a liberal stronghold and, uh, has a very welfare focused, uh, policy basically to, 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 um, supposedly help the underprivileged classes. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that after I think nearly five decades of welfareist intervention, they have some of the worst educational standards and some of the worst health outcomes uh, for any Americans. And, and even and, and in terms of employment as, as well, I mean, they're worse than places in developing economies. I mean, they're, they're shockingly bad uh, outcomes for people. And, and yet they have a very high degree of, of public intervention or, or socialization uh, going on and, and millions of dollars poured in to try and improve the situation and and yet it just gets worse and worse and this is just what we're seeing in the UK as well with our health care it, it just more and more people are ill 
and like like you say um yeah it people are wedded to the ideology and not to the to what the data is showing them yeah yes that's correct and i just like this to be a resource for waking people up a bit and just showing them an alternative you don't have to agree with everything we've said but it should open you up to looking into it more and you know if you know if you see this share it with your lefty friends share it with your friends who are um, in, in the mainstream and get a discussion going with them even if you completely disagree with everything i've said send it to your friends and ask them to give you more feel to disagree with that and you know leave them in comments so that we can see where people who support the nhs are coming from you know and get a dialogue going it's not the end of the conversation mm. get a dialogue going let's put our heads together because you know if you disagree with what john and i have said then you can give us more information and we can yeah process and you know learn from that and come back to you with a response and you know if if someone's watching this and thinks they could do a better job a better deconstruction of health of this so-called uh, free universal health care which is not free it's not universal and it's not health care please you know put another video out uh, that's even better than this one and educate people be, because there needs to be a good resource on YouTube that when anyone is supporting the NHS, there needs to be a good resource on YouTube that when anyone is coming out in favour of the status quo, people can say, check out this video, it's an hour long, it compiles good arguments. I think this one might be one of the leading resources on that topic at the moment. If someone can create a better one, then fantastic you know this needs to be an ongoing dialogue we need to give people hope it's not about just speaking about how terrible the present system is it's about talking about how much better a system we can create yeah yeah i agree um i, th I think one of the things that, that comes up for me quite a bit is is you know even to dare to challenge the ideology uh, you, you face the flamers and the trolls and and the the shamers um, who who will accuse you of of all kinds of you know heartless uh, um, being incompassionate and so on and so forth, which of course is 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 completely a uh, projection as well because anyone who treats you like that is is obviously uh, quite lacking in empathy and compassion themselves. Um, but nevertheless, that that for me is is still you know still I, I think I hold back a bit from from really challenging people and saying well you know. I mean, just look at the numbers, just look at the bare costs of how this system and what it's going to cost if we don't change it in the next 20 years. It's just going to be unaffordable. I mean, it's just going to collapse. Yeah. It has to and we're all, you know, and how much do those people who say, oh, you don't care about the poor and put their ideology of this system, how much do they care about the poor if they're sleepwalking off off a cliff, mm. you know, you're starting yeah. a system which is going to leave, you know, God knows, mil maybe millions of people dispossessed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it's gone so far, you know, but people, if, when you look at the well-known free market advocates, whether it's Milton Friedman and or anyone they were hated they're still hated that's right that people that's don't right. like their ideology challenge okay perhaps Ayn Rand wasn't a very pleasant person right you know I, I believe wrong. Milton yeah you know but but the thing is people hate them because they challenge this view that the, the government can just give people things and and it, all, it won't have any unintended consequences. But the, this, the information necessary, I'm not married to those two figures. I just mentioned them because they're the best known. You know, the, they gave good information on certain incentive structures and certain elements of economics. Each of them did. I'm not saying any of them was right about everything or anything like that. 
people hated them. They didn't take the time to listen and understand where they're coming from. And there's no need to hate on someone if they're wrong, you know, and yeah. you know they're wrong. You just provide a better yeah. analysis. That's right. But whenever you see these people talked about, it's always in moral terms. They always talk about how horrible those people were. They never actually deal just with the nitty no gritty. Or really, <laughs> rarely ever deal with the nitty gritty of their argument. Mm. And I'm sorry that it's gone so far simply because there's been an excellent analysis of economics from the Austrians, Ludwig von Mises, F. Hayek. And these are people that people have never heard of. Yeah. All the information has been there. Murray Rothbard was writing all the way through the 20th century. The information has been there. And people either hate on the people who support it, or they, they don't bother to read up. They, they listen to, there's this left-wing echo chamber yeah. in academia where everyone's a left-winger, or the vast majority of people are. So instead of talking about whether socialism is correct, they're all saying, see, when we have a socialist state, should it be run this way or should it be run this way? Should we do it this way or this way? This imaginary state that doesn't exist they're, they're debating that. They're debating tiny elements of policy and they're not actually going to Milton Friedman, Hayek, Rand, um, Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Tom Woods, an amazing contemporary historian, yeah. Walter, Walter Block, a great economist and um, philosopher, you know, and really studying up these arguments and... Um, and, and, you know, you don't have to agree with them, but at least know what you're talking about. You don't have to come out and say, you know, capitalists are pigs and things like that. You can say, well, you know, those advocates of capitalism attest this, but actually, blah, 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 you know, I, um, you know be well-informed. Be well-informed. Don't, there's, don't there's, put ideology before empirical evidence. Yeah, there's, there's certain kinds of habits there. I mean, it's basically intellectual dishonesty, and, and there's also a great deal of magical thinking and and a lack of just a lack of uh, critical thinking really to to just you know go to the other side of the argument and and hear um, what other people have to say that conflicts with your views it's and it the unusual th and i think the strange thing is of course you know, you know people on the left or the liberal side will accuse others of being closed minded and you know um, fanatical and yet they won't they won't pick up these books or read these articles no. um and in particular uh i think one of the biggest issues for me when i deal with people like that is that they're not prepared to have a criteria that falsifies what they claim you know you say well yes how can i prove you're wrong you know tell me how i can prove yeah. you're wrong and yeah. they just don't yeah. have an answer to it you know the answer is always well uh, yeah that didn't work but we needed to spend more or uh, you know we need to right. we need to have this policy instead and of course these are just more unfalsifiable uh, retorts basically um that, that just fuel fuel the fanaticism and the faithiness of these people um it, and it, it's yes really so i ask i ask um you know if you are a person on the left first of all i really commend you for listening to the whole hour um, but yeah, please drop us a comment. Say what would you need in order to change your mind and stop supporting government healthcare? Mm. You know, let's have some criteria here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a I think a salient point to uh, start closing um, this uh, program on. Um, I think we've covered all of our points there. I'm just going to check the list there. Um, yeah, I, I think we've done very well. Uh, so thank you, Anthony, for um, engaging me again in conversation and uh, uh, getting over your points really clearly. And, and yeah, hopefully we're not going to come over as uh, completely smug and, and cold-hearted. Um, I certainly th don't think we come over like that. So um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear people's uh, opinions on that as well. Um, and yeah, yeah, once again, thank you for, for giving your time.
Thank you for having me on your show again. And uh, I look forward to continuing our partnership. Yeah. There's one more thing I'd like to say to people who are listening, which is whether you like it or not, your health care is your responsibility. Even though the NHS is free at the point of entry, your health care is still your responsibility. If you do not take care of your health, it's not just money that's at stake. You're going to have a lower standard of living. So, you know, a free marketeer might say, you know, your, your health care is your responsibility. And you say, well, no, it's the responsibility of the community. It should be provided by the government. Even though it's provided by the government, it's still your responsibility. You're the person who's going to suffer if you don't take care of your health. So, you know, get a juicer, eat, eat more fruit and vegetables, limit consumption of of things that you know that are bad for you, you stand to gain. You know, do 20 minutes stretching a day, go out for a bike ride, yeah. walk, up a, walk up the side of a mountain, whatever you enjoy, find out a way that you enjoy of looking after your health and do that with your loved ones. You know, you can make it fun. And and we're all responsible for our health care because we're all always the ones who are going to suffer if we don't take care of ourselves. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. It's a great, uh, another great closing point. And um, yeah, for me, that just brings up quite a bit of sorrow around people in my mm. family that, that have suffered for decades with, with chronic ill health and, and have died prematurely, um, won't be seeing their grandchildren. Um, I mean, the negatives are, you know, just forgetting talking about the money and, and the corruption, just the personal consequences of not caring for yourself are absolutely colossal. That's true. And I feel, I'm sorry to hear that about your family, John. And, you know, I feel there's, there's psychological ill health there when people don't take care of themselves. And um, it would be nice if there was more awareness of that in our society. And if you know people who don't take care of themselves, please take some time to listen to them with curiosity and not moralize them and hear what it's like for them and where they're coming from and what they're thinking and um, not 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 to moralize and and to start criticizing them for ha bad habits but to you know maybe gently challenge them and take a lot of time to listen to what they have to say yeah definitely create a connection with these people and yeah I th i'm sure yeah. there's, there's probably a program's worth or a piece in there about uh, self-esteem and, and, and uh, so forth and prior traumas and, and all the rest of it but uh, perhaps on another day uh, so bye for now bye thank you for having me on your show john take care and thanks everyone for listening yeah thanks for listening bye for now